What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Financial Workout channel. So I'm doing a full review on Uber's stock today after what's been some volatile sessions and I hope you get something out of it. All right, so a lot about Uber has changed over the last couple of years, right? Uh, it went public in May of last year due to which their financial disclosure has improved and so has their governance. It's no longer a controversial founder-led business. Travis Kalanick is not even on the board anymore. There's a new management team here and the new CEO and CFO are both committed to becoming profitable. They have decided to get out of the markets where they don't have a path to becoming the number one or number two player in the market and they are guiding to a profitable quarter next year, which was delayed from Q4 of this year just because of the pandemic. It's also become a more diversified business with the delivery business growing the way it has. It's now as big as the ride segment was in 2017. You're also seeing a more rationalized market for rides as it's less of a price war between Uber and Lyft. So I'm going to talk about all of that in this video and why I'm bullish on the stock. The ride segment was about 76% of their business pre-COVID, which has obviously been impacted by the pandemic, and the mix has shifted towards deliveries as a result. So looking at their stock chart, the company went public in May 2019 at a price of $45 a share, didn't have a great IPO, but the stock started gaining some momentum over the following couple of months. Then in August of last year, they reported record losses due to which the stock went down. And then there were also concerns surrounding the lockout period, amongst other things. The lockout period, for those who don't know, is the period where insiders like the management of the company can't sell. So I guess the market had been assuming that some insiders would sell once this lockout period expires. And they certainly did. When the lockout period ended, insiders did sell their shares with the former CEO selling almost his entire stake, sending the stock to then record lows. After the lockout period was behind Uber, their stock gained traction again and having some good earnings combined with positive commentary on profitability helped the stock make a U-shaped recovery and reached back in the $40 range. But then COVID happened and the stock went to a new low of about $14. It has recovered quite a bit since then, but volatility in the stock remains given the pandemic and some company-specific risks that I'm going to be talking about shortly. And I think there's still opportunity here, you know. I bought some before the pandemic, I bought some during the crash, and I continued to buy some more. On the next page, I think we all know the business here. You know, ride sharing and delivery is their main business and that's what I'll be focusing on. Uber Freight and ATG, I think, are still in very early stages and pretty speculative at this point. So I will not be talking about those segments, but they could provide incremental opportunity for Uber in the long term. Anyways, as you can see down below, Uber had great growth in 2019 before the pandemic hit. Total bookings grew at 35% year over year, number of trips grew over 30% year over year, and monthly users grew more than 20% year over year. Obviously those numbers were impacted heavily by COVID and I will be talking about that shortly, but let's really quickly discuss how Uber actually makes money and have a quick overview of the mobility and delivery segment. I don't wanna to spend too much time over here because I think most of you know Uber's business. Uh, on the mobility side, this is their ride hailing segment and how they generate revenue is from fees paid by the driver for the use of the platform, which is generally a fixed percentage of the fare. And in certain markets, they've also started to charge riders a fee for the use of their platform. They have a number one or number two position where they operate their mobility services and are getting out of the markets where they don't have a clear path to becoming the leading player. In the US, they mainly compete with Lyft and boast a share of about 70%. So obviously the mobility segment had a direct impact from the pandemic with bookings being down as much as 80% in April. The company was able to mitigate some impact from having a flexible cost structure and they noted in March that two thirds of their cost of revenue and operating expenses aside from stock compensation is variable. 
So those costs don't occur if there's no trips made. And we certainly saw that with the company being able to generate positive EBITDA in their last quarter, despite bookings being down 75% year over year. Additionally, they have reduced their headcount by 7,000 people and have found material opportunities in their fixed cost structure, which should see major cost savings in the future as well. And then they have also used this opportunity to provide new offerings during this pandemic, like having the option to book one car for several hours or adding new types of transport methods. So like I mentioned, mobility bookings were down 80% in April year over year, but since then it has recovered to being down about 50% as of August. That recovery is being led by countries in Asia, where you see in places like Hong Kong and in New Zealand, where there are not many cases anymore, you see bookings of more than pre-COVID levels, and people are returning to using Uber again as places reopen. Europe is also recovering, with bookings down around 30%, but US has been lagging, where the top markets are still down 50 to 85%. And with the rising COVID cases and uh, potential of lockdowns again, I doubt recovery would match levels of outside US at least for a few months. So what does that mean for profitability for the business? Well, it delays it, but it wouldn't prevent it from happening in my opinion. I mean, you're already seeing profitability on the mobility side, where they were able to generate 30% EBITDA margins in months before COVID, and were still able to generate some EBITDA during the pandemic. Their take rate on the top here has been improving. By the way, take rate is just how much of the ride fare they get to keep after paying drivers. They have a long-term target of 25% for this number, and last quarter they were able to pass that. Their long-term EBITDA margin target is 45%, and in countries, representing 25% of gross bookings have already achieved that target. So I certainly think that they are on the right path and will continue to generate more and more EBITDA in their mobility segment. All right, so let's talk about the delivery segment now. Here, Uber gets revenue from fees paid by the restaurant, which is generally a fixed percentage of the meal, and then they also get some from the courier. In addition, beginning of this year, they also get a service fee from the person ordering in certain markets. So right now, I see delivery segment as the growth engine and mobility as the segment that generates profit. You know, they're already growing a lot with food delivery, but now also expanding into grocery delivery and maybe package delivery in the future. The delivery business is now as big as Rise was in 2017, and their CEO recently said that he expects long-term delivery and mobility would have the same amount of gross bookings. They have a global presence and are number one player in a lot of markets, but they do experience a lot of competition in this side of the business. In the US market, you know, they have over 30% of the share after their acquisition of Postmates, which gives them strong Southwest presence, and they also get a lot of synergies with this acquisition, which should help them in the long term. But the leading player in that segment is DoorDash, which is expected to go public soon. And we should expect some more competition from DoorDash as they become public, since they would get more funds and invest more in their business to try to become a larger player. During this pandemic, you have the delivery segment seeing accelerating growth and serving as a great hedge for the Uber's ride business at this time. Bookings doubled in Q2 year over year and are up 130% in August and has helped offset the lower demand on the ride side. This took total bookings to being down less than 10% in August. So from a bookings perspective, they are almost at the same point as they were last year. From a profitability perspective, I think it has helped the delivery segment, but I still think there might be some way to go given the increased competition in this segment compared to rides. But it still should follow the ride segment, you know, where you invest heavily into getting more users on the app and then slowly start to increase prices and pay less in incentives as you find an equilibrium point between demand of users and supply of couriers and restaurants. Furthermore, they are still focusing on the profitability on the delivery side as well. 
They got out of the Korean and Indian markets, which accounted for a good chunk of their losses, and they are generating some EBITDA in two of their top five markets. So again, trends for that look good too. They have their long-term take rate target set at 15%, currently it's around 11%, and EBITDA margin target of 30%. So I think they wouldn't achieve that as fast as they would achieve their rides targets, but they are certainly going in the right direction. And examples of that can be seen in the next few slides here. You know, they are profitable in France, which is one of their top five markets. They had more than four competitors, but were able to become the leader and generate positive cash flow. Belgium is one of the smaller markets that they are profitable in. And then in Japan, they are not profitable yet, but are growing tremendously. I mean, look at that growth, 400%. That's amazing. And then, you know, they also have their freight segment where they generate revenue for their transportation services provided to shippers. It's a small segment, so it doesn't matter too much right now, but could be a bigger player in the industry in the future. Still too early to say, but they recently got an investment of $500 million in this unit, valuing the freight business at over $3 billion. All right, so let's talk some financials. I have their KPIs and what I see from that is how everything in each segment has been growing tremendously. The ride segment grew at a CAGR of about 30% from 2017 to 2019. The delivery segment had been growing massively even before the pandemic and that growth has only accelerated after the pandemic. And with both of these segments, you're seeing the adjusted net revenue is growing faster than bookings as a result of improvements in their take rates. You're also seeing monthly active users at the bottom grew at a CAGR of 30% with trips growing at 35%. So you're seeing Uber keeps gaining new users and existing users are using platform more often than before, which gives me more confidence in the company's ability to expand into markets while also improving their take rates. So then going into my model here, I have total bookings down 13% for the year with ride segment down 45%, which I have recovering next year as a result of possible vaccine in Q1 or Q2 of next year. I'm assuming a modest growth in take rates from there, which would drive improving margins as a result. I have their costs rising in dollar amount, but becoming less as a percent of revenue as they benefit from their scale and degree of operating leverage. As a result, I do have them generating positive EBITDA in 2020 too, which is in line with the management's guide to generate a positive EBITDA quarter at some point next year. Note that my model is slightly more conservative than what analysts are expecting, so there still could be upside here. And then recent developments, I already talked enough about COVID, but the thing to note here is that there could be some volatility as Europe has started to go in lockdown again and COVID cases are reaching record highs in the US and a lot of other places. In addition to that risk, there are regulatory risks here as well. And this is especially important today because there is a legal battle in California where this law called AB5 attempts to classify if a worker is a contractor or an employee based on a test. So the Attorney General of California filed a complaint against Uber and Lyft for their classification of drivers as contractors and they were ordered to classify their drivers as employees. Both companies appealed that decision and have been allowed to operate normally during the appeals process and they also, along with DoorDash, funded a ballot initiative called Proposition 22, where they are proposing certain rights to drivers like minimum earnings and healthcare allowances, while also allowing drivers to be independent. This would be on the ballot in California this week, and people will vote on that. And Uber's internal polling suggests that 72% of the drivers would vote yes to Proposition 22. But in the event that the general public doesn't vote yes, there is uncertainty around what the future would hold for Uber in California and potentially other states or even other countries. So I get if someone doesn't like this stock because of that reason. But when I think about the probability of that happening on a wide scale, I think it's really low. So I don't think it will have much of an impact, but it is a risk nonetheless that people need to be aware of. So moving into my thesis and some of the strengths and weaknesses, 
Uh, some of these trends I mentioned, but Uber is a good diversified business with a strong brand name. And it's a business that I think adds great value to all the players involved. You know, with the drivers having a flexible opportunity to earn, restaurants getting an online mobile presence, and end users getting quick on-demand services. With the markets rationalizing more, combined with the company's ability to improve their take rates as well as their commitment to become profitable, we should start seeing them generate some profit soon. They have a promising path to profitability that I think is achievable as they have shown in some of their top markets that they are able to achieve the targets that they stated. And if that's not next year, then it would be in the following year. I don't think it's a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. In addition, even if the pandemic is prolonged, they have the delivery segment where we are not only seeing great platform synergies, but during this environment, it's acting as a great hedge for the business. They also have great liquidity with the cash position of about 8 billion, so this should be fine even with the longer pandemic. It's just that their profitability might get delayed some more. So given all that, my conviction level for the business is pretty high and, and that is why I have their stock with an overweight position in my portfolio. But like I said, there are weaknesses, there are risks. You know, the delivery segment is an industry that faces a lot of competition from players like DoorDash and Grubhub and there's no real switching cost for consumers. And then there are regulatory risks as well. So there's certainly reasons to not invest in this stock if you're looking for them. I just think the risk reward is heavily skewed towards the reward side and that's why I keep buying this stock and despite all the weaknesses, I remain confident in the company's ability to generate cash flow in the long term. So that's my thesis. But this next week is going to be important because we have the election where we would have some clarity on Proposition 22 versus AB5. So I do expect some volatility. In addition, they're also releasing their earnings on November 5th. So it would be interesting to see their outlook on pandemic and what they've seen in October regarding their right side. So I do expect some volatility in the next week and I just wanted to make this video and get ahead of it so that you guys know about the business and have and have an opportunity to add to your portfolio if you'd want. I'll probably make a follow up video, probably not on YouTube, but on my other social media as soon as their earnings come out or we have some clarity on Proposition 22. So make sure you follow me on my other social media channels so you have the most up-to-date information on the company.